some of you who may not have exposure to rheology uh, will get a quick idea about uh, some of these models. And then the second part of the lecture, uh, I'll talk about some of our work and how uh, modifications of these basics models are useful in uh, looking at uh, uh, research of uh, complex materials where we are trying to understand the mechanisms involved uh, in those materials while they are being deformed uh, in practical situations. So uh, let me start the first part of the uh, presentation by Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? Hello. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if I go to the next page, it does go to the next page, right? Yeah. Second page now? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I'll, I'll start. Uh, so the way I, I have uh, 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 structured, as I said, is uh, we'll just have an introduction to continuum models of nonlinear rheology uh, before we look at the uh, uh, application of uh, the extension of some of these models to specific material systems later on. So the first part of uh, the uh, uh, talk today, uh, I'll uh, uh, discuss uh, the uh, overall uh, thought process behind uh, the analysis of uh, rheological response. Uh, uh, crucial to this is the uh, idea of uh, relaxation processes and uh, complex uh, fluids uh, generally have uh, multiple relaxation processes and uh, the time scales and length scales uh, of these uh, relaxation processes vary. And uh, that's why uh, uh, understanding of these materials, uh, their deformation behavior becomes quite uh, challenging. Uh, I have seen that you have already had a lecture on uh, linear viscoelasticity. Uh, I'll just uh, briefly talk about it uh, just to uh, set the stage and also because many of the models are uh, extensions of linear viscoelastic models. So we will uh, look at uh, some general uh, concepts related to linear viscoelasticity. And uh, as we talk about nonlinear rheology, uh, the idea is to look at material at uh, large deformations. Uh, and uh, since we are looking at large deformations, uh, the uh, uh, the rates, uh, because rate of change of stress or rate of change of strain, all of these quantities, we have to evaluate derivatives. Uh, and uh, so we need uh, derivatives which are appropriate for tensor quantities such as stress and strain. So therefore, I'll discuss briefly about uh, convected rate. We also need, in addition to this, uh, the, the strain itself also. So large deformation strain is also uh, needed. And uh, so this also I, I'll spend some time on. And uh, then uh, finally, uh, after that, uh, having done this, we will also then look at uh, the uh, nonlinear model, some example of it. and uh, the upper convected uh, Maxwell model. And uh, finally, I'll spend some time on uh, the uh, book textbook examples of nonlinear models in which uh, I look at uh, Gesicker's model briefly and also another model which is quite commonly used for polymer processing, which is PTT model. So uh, feel free to interrupt uh, if you can, uh, if you have any questions, uh, once in a while, I'll uh, scroll back and look at the text box. Uh, so if you have any query, please uh, type. If you are reluctant to speak, uh, I will also be very happy if you can interrupt me using audio. Uh, in, in some sense, uh, that's the only way I can know that you're all there. Otherwise, I may be just speaking to the camera at my home. So uh, just uh, let me know if you have any questions or queries or if uh, there are any clarifications. I, I will periodically look at uh, the text box as well as uh, please interrupt me uh, using audio. So uh, 
generally the uh, analysis of uh, the uh, rheological response uh, uh, what uh, we tend to do is to first uh, look at you know what class does this response belong to uh, generally we tend to identify that oh i can treat the fluid as a viscous fluid itself uh, for example if uh, the uh, changes are not very rapid and uh, the geometries involved are uh, uh, not changing rapidly. For example, flow through a straight pipe. Uh, in this case, mostly it's a steady state flow and also the pipe uh, uh, is basically of a constant cross section. So in such cases, uh, no matter how complex a fluid is, uh, assuming viscous fluid uh, can uh, give us a good enough understanding so that we can uh, decide pumping action, we can decide flow rates and so on. So given an engineering problem in hand, uh, we need to first decide you know, which class of uh, problems we are going to look at. For example, a material may be an yield stress material. Uh, however, uh, if we are looking at, let's say it's flow, uh, again under steady state situation, then again, uh, it doesn't make sense to look at yield stress because yield stress is only when uh, strain rates are exceedingly small or stress values are also small then the yielding phenomena in the material is of relevance. But again, if it's a pumping uh, through a pipeline of an yield stress material at steady state, then uh, we might as well uh, look at uh, this uh, problem uh, and uh, as a bundling complex material as a way. So therefore, uh, we generally need to take a look at, you know, what is the qualitative description of the material response and what may be the class of response that we want to analyze and uh, this uh, unfortunately is not dependent on the material it depends on uh, the engineers and scientists which are looking at a problem so we need to uh, define the problem and then we will be able to make these judgments having made these judgments then it becomes easier for us to uh, start looking at uh, the uh, rheological response of the material and we start doing that by uh, defining material functions since uh, uh, in case of uh, fluid mechanics, uh, Newtonian fluid mechanics, the viscosity characterizes uh, everything about the material and uh, uh, the Navier-Stokes equations for an incompressible Newtonian fluid is a complete statement of uh, uh, linear momentum balance for it. However, uh, for uh, any other general fluid, uh, we, we don't know how to understand and characterize the fluid and, and how do we propose a relationship for it uh, so that we can solve problems and to help us do that uh, rather than measuring uh, in Newtonian case we just need to measure viscosity and we are done uh, in this case we need to figure out what are the quantities that can be measured and uh, so the quantification of material response is done by carrying out uh, rheological measurements or rheometry under control conditions so for example viscosity is measured at constant strain rate and uh, we wait for steady state to be reached, then we measure the ratio of stress to strain rate and we get viscosity. So this is a control condition in which strain rate is kept constant. So this also could be measured for a complex fluid and uh, by then we will just get the viscosity that uh, we got for a Newtonian fluid. Only thing is we recognize that this is a function now and uh, it's a function uh, of uh, the strain rate and it's no longer a constant and so saying that uh, it's a non-newtonian viscous fluid is hardly saying anything because it could be non-newtonian in so many different ways so uh, we need to in addition to specifying that it's a non-newtonian viscous fluid we need to specify some other details regarding you know what is the nature of the dependency of eta on gamma dot so from a, a conceptual point of view, we need to specify whether viscosity is constant at low strain rates, is it a shear thinning material, uh, does it have an yield stress, does viscosity go to infi infinity at very low strain rates. So we need to specify qualitatively some of these quantities and then mathematically we need to say, you know, what kind of uh, model we can use to describe this. So similarly, uh, given that viscoelastic materials, uh, the uh, dependency of stress and strain and strain rate are interrelated to each other through a complex set of mechanisms because of the underlying relaxation processes, uh, 
uh, we can carry out these controlled experiment under variety of conditions. So we could keep a constant stress and measure creep compliance, or uh, we could uh, keep a constant strain and measure relaxation modulus. Uh, we could also, instead of doing uh, measurements in shear, we could do measurements in extensional mode. And, and so the, these are various uh, material functions that we try to characterize a, a, a complex fluid for. And uh, which of these material function is most relevant, again, depends on the problem at hand, the material at hand, and what is our judgment about what class of response we are trying to see. And so the third step in this overall uh, analysis of rheological response is where the modeling comes in. Uh, so having characterized the material function, uh, having uh, focused on one class of response, uh, we still need to make sure that our understanding is reasonable. And that can be done by uh, making a hypothesis of a constitutive model uh, based on the mechanisms or phenomenology of the response that we see. And then we can see if we can describe uh, the material functions uh, nicely, uh, qualitatively as well as quantitatively. And so uh, many of the constitutive models can be phenomenological. And uh, uh, for example, for viscosity, we may have just Caro Yosuda model for a uh, yield stress material. We have we may have Herschel Berkeley model. And, and so, so there are several possibilities of this constitutive model. And the purpose of these models uh, in this context of rheology is to make sure that uh, we can measure these material functions under different conditions by varying strain, stress, strain rate, temperature, or uh, uh, composition if it's a multi-phase system. So can we then explain this variation using a model? Can we capture the behavior qualitatively and quantitatively using a model? So this is the overall process uh, that we generally follow uh, in terms of analysis uh, of the rheological response. Uh, on a broad level, uh, we are looking at uh, the two extremes of uh, viscous and elastic response. And uh, this all of you are aware of that uh, in case of uh, viscous response, uh, we are basically looking at current state of stress related to current state of strain rate. And a uh, very important uh, feature here is uh, basically the current configuration. So whatever is the current stress in the material that completely determines the current strain rate and vice versa. So this is a feature of uh, viscous dissipative response. And uh, if we apply a constant stress on the material, we end up achieving a steady state. In the By the way, that uh, strain, strain rate also becomes constant. And then the stress, stress and strain rate are related to each other. Uh, and uh, uh, the material keeps on dissipating energy as long as we keep on applying the stress. When we remove the stress, uh, the material deformation completely stops. And uh, the if we look at the material configuration in terms of position and uh, uh, random motion of uh, these uh, molecules of these complex fluids or particles uh, of a multi-phase system, uh, there is no difference in terms of uh, how it was uh, before all the force was imposed on the material. So therefore, uh, the stress-free configurations in case of these viscous materials uh, can be uh, uh, multiple. Uh, we can take a fluid in a jar and uh, it's stress-free and I can spread it on the floor and again it becomes stress-free. So on the other hand, if I take a rod of solid and then if I make it into a very thin disc, uh, then there will be uh, a uh, lot of uh, deformation uh, that uh, has to happen. And we clearly know that this is uh, undeformed. And then when I press it, it's a deformed configuration. So therefore, uh, the elastic uh, uh, config uh, materials on the other hand, uh, current state of stress and strain are related to each other. And these are conservative and energy storing materials. So when we... Uh, uh, look at uh, them from the energy point of view. These two are uh, clearly distinct in terms of their uh, mechanisms uh, at a molecular and microscopic scale. Uh, the viscous response is uh, associated with uh, uh, relaxation and uh, uh, Brownian motion of uh, liquid and gas molecules, while uh, elastic response is associated with a, a fixed position occupied in a crystalline lattice. So these are two uh, extreme cases 
of molecular uh, mechanisms which contribute to dissipative or storage response in these materials. Naturally, these two uh, are the extreme cases and complex uh, fluids have combinations of uh, these and therefore uh, they show a viscoelastic response. And uh, the viscous and elastic response in case of viscoelastic response, uh, the uh, variations of uh, time scale uh, will change uh, how much of uh, viscous response is there and how much of elastic response is there. So as I mentioned earlier, given that there are multiple uh, length scales and time scales in a complex fluid, uh, the relative contributions uh, may vary depending on time scale of our interest. So uh, uh, that's what I meant uh, when I said earlier that it doesn't depend on the material, the class of response and uh, how do we analyze it uh, will all depend on what is the problem at hand. And uh, so the, uh, as far as uh, formulation of a, a model is concerned for uh, viscoelasticity, the current states of stress uh, are related to basically each and every other variable also. And uh, many more such uh, possibilities are there. So unlike in case of elastic or viscous response, where uh, current state of stress determines strain rate, or uh, in case of elasticity, current state of strain determined stress. In this case, we not only have to keep track of uh, stress and strain and strain rate, but maybe rate of change of these quantities also. So therefore, uh, we, uh, one way to look at it uh, is to say that, you know, all these rates and quantities are related to each other. And uh, this kind of a statement is, uh, will be called a rate type of model. Uh, conversely, we could also look at it saying that the current state of stress in the material depends on whatever is the past history of deformation. And uh, this kind of a statement uh, can be written as an integral uh, type model. Where we say that we can sum up contributions due to all past deformations until the present time and therefore the stress at present time depends on all the contributions which are coming from the past. So therefore we have to integrate over uh, time from very long time in the history till current time. So the formulation of how we try to describe the deformation response of the mod material uh, depends on these two uh, alternate approaches. Uh, many models have uh, uh, counterparts in both. Uh, so we will see, for example, that uh, uh, Maxwell model, the most uh, simple viscoelastic model, can be written uh, in uh, both differential or rate type or an integral type. Uh, we will also see that uh, there is an upper convected Maxwell model. And uh, that uh, uh, looks... Uh, is same as uh, the large uh, rubber-like liquid model, which is the integral type model. Uh, historically also, depending on the development and how the arguments have uh, been placed, uh, many of the models are rate type or integral type. Uh, in case of polymer melts, where uh, all the macromolecules are entangled with each other, uh, entanglement and reptation is a very important uh, mechanism uh, before, uh, to explain uh, and to capture mathematically before we can describe the rheological response. And uh, the doi edwards model uh, is an example of uh, an integral model which was, uh, which captures the reptation uh, motion of macromolecules and explains the rheological response to a certain degree. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are several uh, continuum models which are uh, based on Oldroyd, uh, which are all uh, ray type models. So depending on the history of development, uh, we have both of these formulations using which we can try to describe the viscoelasticity in materials. And uh, of course, while we are trying to explain the complex response uh, of uh, the uh, fluid of interest, uh, one uh, predominant uh, theme that uh, runs through uh, our analysis is trying to explain the terminal response or to examine the materials under limiting conditions. So for example, if we allow long enough time or if we uh, uh, do test the material at very slow, uh, low frequencies, 
do we get uh, a viscous response predominantly even though uh, at uh, frequencies of engineering interest or frequency of applications uh, the material may be viscoelastic uh, similarly whether uh, the uh, uh, frequency dependence uh, vanishes in the sense uh, is the material becomes a rubber like material or a gel like material where uh, the storage modulus or loss modulus are no longer function of frequency so it behaves like an elastic network material so so these are all uh, features that we try to examine uh, under certain limiting conditions and make sure that our complex uh, fluid can uh, be explained not only under uh, the whole range uh, of interest but even under terminal conditions and the mechanisms that we are capturing uh, through our analysis explain uh, the uh, behavior at all ranges of time and frequency so therefore terminal response is very useful uh, in terms of making sure that uh, the model is also correct and our understanding of the material is also correct so so with this uh, i'll pause here are there any questions so we we just uh, looked at uh, broadly uh, uh, the uh, contours of uh, rheological response analysis uh, if there are any questions uh, i'll give a half a minute uh, hello sir yeah uh, sir I have a question sir yeah yeah sure, sure. so when this metal uh, metal properties like uh, shear modulus and loss modulus is not a function of a frequency ah uh ha -huh. yeah so for for rubber uh, rubber so uh, for for a, for, a, for example a gel a cross linked uh, polymer gel uh, over a limited range of frequencies what you will see is that g prime and g double prime will be independent of frequency only for cross link polymer uh, yeah, po yeah. so polymer generally gels, uh, gels uh, so they are defined as gels uh, in fact the definition of uh, whether you have a gel or not uh, generally people will say okay let me try to just measure g prime and g double prime and see whether it's independent of frequency so if you take cross link rubber uh, which is not a gel material it's a network lightly cross linked polymer uh, but if you measure its rheological response at low frequencies you will see the same response that g prime is greater than g double prime because of the network okay. elasticity however g okay. prime and g double prime are both uh, independent of frequency at very low frequency so maybe i'll i'll just uh, uh, spend couple of minutes okay. and uh, draw this and maybe send, uh, explain okay yeah any okay. other question okay. uh, as i'm trying to uh, okay just uh i'm having some trouble manipulating the menu on my software okay fine uh what i will do is uh i just go back i was thinking of adding a new page sorry just give me a minute huh? there seems to be some issue ah okay uh, are you able to see the screen yes sir okay uh, so yes sir ah yes, uh, okay okay it seems to be some something is uh, wrong with my keyboard okay okay i will manage uh, so uh, as i was saying if you look at the uh, rubber 
and uh, measure uh, the uh, g prime as a function of frequency and g double prime as a function of frequency what you will see is uh, so this is uh, g prime and this is g double prime so over a limited range uh, g prime and g double prime are independent of frequency but however if you uh, uh, go further then uh, you have a variation where g prime will increase like this and g double prime may change like this so so this this response is uh, basically where uh, due to network elasticity or in other words the segments stretching themselves and then recovering so elastic at the same time uh, uh, due to the cross link network uh, this behavior is observed and so many other gels are defined uh, based on this kind of a response so i hope uh, i think that was giri babu who asked that question so that satisfies uh, the maxwell relaxation time is what jaydeep is asking yeah i i'll i'll do that uh, right now so uh, the uh, we'll just uh, have uh, a few minutes on maxwell model uh, just to uh, understand uh, uh, what we uh, have in terms of uh, viscoelastic response and uh, so if 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 uh, i were to remove this term uh, then uh, i have only the newtonian fluid uh, because stress is proportional to strain rate right and uh, so therefore uh, the maxwell model uh, incorporates uh, idea from both elastic and viscous response and the key parameter uh, which uh, describes this is this relaxation time and uh, to understand uh, the relaxation time uh, the relaxation time is uh, is a process uh, is characterizes a process in the material uh, uh, which uh, we will call the relaxation process so relaxation process is uh, necessary necessarily a uh, dissipative uh, process in the material so if you have a perfect crystal uh, with uh, and we are only looking at small deformations if i deform uh, there is no dissipative process possible because uh, i have taken a material uh, and it's a crystalline lattice and uh, if i deform it Uh, let's say i apply a shear deformation what happens is uh, the material will get deformed but uh, that is uh, the energy stored in the material because uh, i have pulled atom uh, away from its minimum energy configuration and therefore i have to do work and that work gets stored as strain energy in the material and when i release the force or when i uh, remove the deformation the material will uh, come back and so from the deformed configuration to the uh, undeformed configuration so in the process of applying this constant strain on the material uh, no relaxation process or no dissipative process is available in this material or in other words i can say that the relaxation time of this material is infinite because there is uh, nothing uh, the process cannot happen or the characteristic time of that process is infinite on the other hand if i take a, a fluid uh, uh, system uh, i have these random molecules uh, which are bombarding each other and going uh, everywhere on this system now i again impose a constant strain by just moving the plate a little bit to the right so that i take fluid between two plates and then just move the plate to the right what happens in this case is once i finish moving it's a new uh, deformed configuration there is no way to come back because uh, fluid uh, molecules will move also and then they again will continue to uh, have their brownian motion and interactions and so what happened to the mechanical energy that was used to displace the plate has gone into the fluid and it's got dissipated so relaxation time for the fluid is in fact zero or instantaneous relaxation happened or the uh, energy that was input in terms of mechanical energy to displace the plate got dissipated into the material instantaneously so therefore we have looked at uh, these two cases where uh, in one case uh, lambda is infinity and the other case lambda is zero 
but uh, in general for a complex fluids we will have a lambda which is uh, uh, depending on the type of mechanisms that are available so if you look at uh, macromolecule as a chain uh, object a polymer uh, we have basically single bond which is let's say a ch bond or cc bond so there are time scales associated with this uh, so the the bond stretching and those will be in picoseconds and so on then there will be uh, rotations around uh, these bonds and so that also will be uh, again uh, very small time scales then we can have uh, a segment a part of the polymer chain can also change conformations and that may be milliseconds and uh, that kind of time frame and then if this particular molecule is entangled with other molecules then there will be also motion of how this molecule like a snake has to move about when it's surrounded by all the other macromolecules so what's called the reptation motion and that may take uh, uh, minutes or hours so you can see that uh, relaxation processes in this uh, macromolecular system uh, can dissipate energy at various different time scales so the relaxation times may vary from very small to very large and so that's the idea of uh, relaxation process Uh, that is very simply captured by a phenomenal phenomenological model like uh, maxwell model and uh, so this uh, uh, idea uh, can also be expressed uh, in terms of just uh, uh, integrating the maxwell model uh, using this integrating factor approach and you can say that the stress is uh, uh, an exponential function uh, multiplied by the history of the deformation so the same differential equation that i showed uh, just using integrating factor we can convert into an integral model and now we can interpret this saying that uh, this is like an instantaneous modulus uh, t prime is the dummy variable of integration and uh, that varies from very much in the past to the present so t is the present time and so uh, this is uh, basically the deformation that the material saw at some time in the past t prime and uh, because that strain rate into delta t gives you the strain and that multiplied by an effective modulus which was effective at t minus t prime time and the way maxwell model is uh, if you look at it uh, when t minus t prime is uh, zero which means it's the present time g of t is g it's a constant value and in fact it's maximum if uh, t minus t prime is uh, infinite in the sense it's way past in the uh, history then uh, g of t is actually goes to zero which means the modulus is zero for way back in the past and modulus is uh, very high in the present so this is the idea of uh, viscoelastic uh, memory uh, the fact that past deformation is relevant but the immediate past deformation is far more relevant compared to much longer past and this is because of the relaxation processes that happen in the material if we give material enough time then due to relaxation processes like uh, in case of uh, liquid we saw that uh, even after deformation was there uh, there is no consequence of it in the material so because material relaxes uh, away and therefore uh, there is no deformation uh, uh, effect of deformation remaining in the material so i hope uh, that uh, explains uh, the uh, overall idea of relaxation time and uh, given that materials are uh, complex uh, we generally have uh, 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 the statement that there are several relaxation processes that are there in the material and for macromolecules i already described uh, for example there is a segmental relaxation there is a, a side group rotation uh, relaxation there could be a reptation relaxation so there are several relaxation processes and each and every relaxation process will be associated with one particular relaxation time and uh, we assume that uh, if these relaxation processes are independent of each other and each of the relaxation process can be described using a maxwell model then we can describe the overall material using a generalized maxwell model
which says that you know there are several maxwell model in parallel so that uh, each one is associated with a set of parameters and we can map each and every maxwell mode so these are also called the relaxation mode so each and every relaxation mode can be associated with a mechanism in the material and so this is how uh, linear viscoelasticity is very useful in terms of understanding uh, the mechanisms of the material uh, and the deformation behavior of the material so uh, uh in terms of uh, a, a general model of uh, viscoelasticity uh, instead of it being only a function of uh, maxwell model uh, this is maxwell model uh on the other hand uh, the kelvin voigt model will have uh, uh, this term and uh, then uh, this term and this term so there are all, all the models are incorporated in this uh, very general equation and so any model that we look is a subclass of this kind of a material so technically speaking when we are trying to look at large deformation behavior uh, this general concept of viscoelasticity which is valid only for linear deformation because this is a linear equation you can see that uh, strain or strain rate or any of these variables are uh, there uh, as a single there are no non linear terms in this equation and so expansion uh, extending of these equations to non linear uh, large deformations can give us a a good set of models because these models already work for small deformation then it will be our endeavor to see whether these will work for large deformations also so uh, i'll skip uh, part of this uh, where uh, the general statements of uh, linear viscoelasticity can be written in differential or integral form but uh, now let's look at uh, large deformation and non linear behavior and uh, in that case uh, the derivatives that we had in our constitutive models uh, will have to be uh, replaced by frame invariant uh, derivatives or appropriate measures for large deformation and uh, just to motivate this uh, i will not spend much time on this but just to motivate this uh, we know that acceleration uh, is a material derivative of velocity it is not partial derivative of velocity so that's why we define something called substantial derivative or material derivative so if i am interested in capturing acceleration of a fluid element or a fluid particle i must evaluate the material or substantial derivative of the velocity so similarly if i am interested in rate of change of stress or rate of change of strain rate or rate of change of strain then i must not evaluate either the partial or material derivatives but i have to use uh, these uh, derivatives which have been shown uh, from a continuum mechanics point of view to be frame invariant and material objective and they are the appropriate measures so if i am interested in rate of change of stress uh it's actually the material derivative and some additional terms and depending on there are various definitions possible for these derivatives and from a mathematical point of view all of them are appropriate it's from a physical point of view that we have to try to see which one works well for a given particular material and a given particular phenomena that we are trying to model so for example upper convected uh, maxwell model Uh, or upper convected derivatives are used lot more commonly compared to lower convected derivative from a mathematical point of view these two arise because while describing three dimensional space we can use covariant or contravariant measures so from a mathematical point of view these two are completely equivalent either of these can be used but from a physical point of view having used them in for to describe real material systems we have come to recognize that some of these uh, derivatives make much more physical sense and therefore we use them so but one of the first criteria first thing that we have to realize is when we start looking at non linear deformation is to talk about these derivatives which are 
or convected derivatives or co-rotational derivatives, basically derivatives which are appropriate measure. Similarly, strain also, uh, we define uh, strain in terms of uh, small deformation all the time and we define Hooke's law in terms of strain where strain is considered uh, to be the infinitesimal strain tensor. But for any large deformation uh, where, uh, let's say we have uh, x tau uh, at any time tau and x is at present time. And uh, so what I can do is I can take a material and then look at a small uh, material fiber and uh, it's let's say dx at present time but in some other time which is could be in the past or future or uh, so it's the relation between these two which tells me whether deformation is happening in the material. If let's say there is only translation happening, then this material particle will get just translated and uh, this quantity which is called uh, deformation gradient will be unity. So in addition to defining derivatives appropriately, we also have to define strain which is valid for arbitrarily large deformations. So these are two uh, concepts which are uh, required before we can start looking at the nonlinear models of uh, viscoelasticity or rheological models. So before I go further, are there any questions? Uh, sir, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Sir, uh, when, uh, when you are talking about this uh, upper convective derivative and lower convective derivative, the, what kind of physical uh, uh, difference it will arise uh, when you use these derivatives or uh, models? Uh, no, but what do you mean by physical difference will arise? Uh, like, uh, see, uh, see, you said that uh, upper convective model uh, gives you uh, physical, uh, physically relevant to the, for yeah. the polymeric solution. Right, so, uh, yeah. so, so what is that property uh, which... Uh, ha, ha, okay, yeah, yeah. So. So for example, uh, we, we will uh, see quickly that uh, upper convected Maxwell model is the simplest uh, uh, nonlinear viscoelastic model that says that uh, there is normal stress difference in the fluid. And there are many uh, polymeric materials as well as colloidal systems which show normal stress differences. And, and so uh, upper convected Maxwell model says that the first normal stress difference is non-zero while the second normal stress difference is zero. And uh, that's not correct, but at least it's qualitatively better than the lower convected Maxwell model, which says that second normal stress difference is non-zero and first normal stress difference is zero. And we don't know any material for which first normal stress difference is zero and second normal stress difference is non-zero. So therefore, clearly lower con oh. uh, convected Maxwell model uh, gives us a, uh, a result which doesn't seem to be observed in materials. So that's that's what I mean. But uh, uh, from a mathematical point of view, both the models oh. can be used. Yeah. Uh, while use of okay. partial derivative is completely ruled out from the mathematical conceptual point of view itself. But having started using these uh, co-deformational and co-rotational and convected derivatives, uh, mathematical guideline is no longer sufficient. We have to bring in our physical insights and characterization to start saying which one of these are more realistic. Okay. Any other question? Okay, uh, then we'll proceed further. So uh, the uh, form of these equations, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, can be the rate type uh, models or integral models. And uh, within the rate type model itself, uh, since we already uh, have a good understanding of linear viscoelasticity of materials uh, with uh, oscillatory shear, creep, stress relaxation, and we have, uh, let's say, a good understanding of the material response and, uh, in linear viscoelastic regime, uh, we would have some access to uh, linear viscoelastic models. So by replacing the strain measures, replacing the derivatives, we can immediately get a nonlinear model. 
so for example a maxwell model can be converted to a non linear model by choosing appropriately the upper convected derivative so same thing can be done with yield stress materials or a thixotropic model we can convert them to their non linear counterparts by using the appropriate measures uh there are other sets of uh, rate type models uh, which uh, historically have been developed for a particular class of uh, materials for example uh, ptt model uh, is uh, quite uh, popular uh, in terms of uh, use in melts in uh, polymer processing polymer processing is basically injection molding and uh, extrusion many of the techniques by which we make all these plastic objects and to describe the uh, entangled uh, macromolecules uh, this ptt model was a phenomenological description that uh, you know you have all this uh, uh, with all these macromolecules and uh, there are uh, junctions and these are uh, junctions which can break and reform so it's it's a phenomenological theory which tries to uh, conceptualize how the segments can move how the junctions can form and break and then come up with a constitutive model and uh, so that's the ptt model and similarly gesicus model uh, is uh, for uh, solution and uh, it makes a hypothesis of how uh, the macromolecule and uh, the uh, fluid which is uh, surrounding it can exchange uh, 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 drag and uh, the drag may not be described completely using uh, an isotropic uh, behavior but some anisotropy may be involved because macromolecular segments get deformed whenever they are under uh, flow conditions under shear or extension or whatever may be the deformation so therefore these are non linear uh, phenomenological models which are also very useful uh, we we no longer uh, may agree with some of the mechanisms in the microscopic picture uh, with which they were developed but both of these ptt model for uh, uh, polymer melts and uh, gesicus model for many gels and solutions these are very commonly used because they they do capture qualitative response very well and of course there is also integral counterparts uh, similarly uh, which uh, uh, for example lodge model which is uh, integral counterpart of upper convected maxwell model uh, we can also distinguish these models based on you know uh, how the origin was and whatever i described so far are only the continuum phenomenological model uh, but for example you can also have a microscopic uh, molecular model and uh, one of the simplest uh, microscopic mechanical model is to say that uh, macromolecule is like a spring uh, two beads which are connected uh, through spring and then uh, this is uh, in a, a sea of solvent and uh, so the solvent uh, uh, and these uh, beads uh, exchange uh, brownian force and there is friction so this is a microscopic picture now where i am saying that i represent macromolecules with a spring and bead uh, basically a dumbbell and uh, the solvent and uh, the uh, beads exchange this brownian force uh, due to random motion of solvent molecules and then friction because there is relative velocity between the bead and the surrounding solvent and then the spring has a force which represents the stretching of the polymer chain and its ability to recover back so if i put in these microscopic mechanisms and uh, develop a theory uh, i i basically get a model uh, which is uh, the dumbbell model uh, and 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 dumbbell model also happens to be same as the oldroyd b model of uh, continuum mechanics or uh, or the phenomenological model so sometimes there is a direct correspondence between microscopic and macroscopic models though they have been derived using completely different arguments but many times uh, the microscopic model you may not have a closed form differential or integral equation you may only have to do numerically the solution to uh, look at uh, stress strain response and uh, so therefore uh, but we go back and forth between these different set of models uh, whenever we are trying to work on a given material
so the uh, Maxwell model, uh, if you recall, I had just written it as uh, tau plus lambda del tau by del t is equal to eta gamma dot. And uh, so this is just a three-dimensional version of it uh, and uh, correct where the partial derivative is replaced with upper convected derivative and uh, one-dimensional gamma dot is now replaced with uh, the strain rate tensor. And uh, the yx component, if you write out, uh, so these are all the components which are associated. This is the convected rate associated with uh, this. Uh, so there is a partial derivative, then there is a material uh, derivative, and then there are additional terms. And these are the nonlinear terms also. So your screen is not uh, visible. Oh, I see. Uh, what is visible now? No, the screen is visible. Visible, sir. It's a uh, screen is visible, sir. Yes, sir. Screen, screen is visible, screen sir. Is visible, sir. Okay. Uh, who, who was saying that it's not visible? Uh, Kanchan, sir. It's not visible to me. Uh -huh. So what what do you get uh, as the? Uh, I mean. Uh, Uh, maybe you have to disconnect and connect again just to see whether uh, that's the problem. Uh, I just erased something. So you're able to see the erasing the rest of you other than Kanchan? Yes, sir. It's clear. Um, we are able to see what you're writing and erasing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I think Kanchan, uh, the best thing maybe is to just quit and join again. I mean, these are all the things where you shut down and start and hopefully things work. <laughs> In fact, I am tempted to do because my software is behaving a little bit funny and uh, some of the things I'm not able to do. But anyway, I'll continue for some time and then we'll see. So uh, uh, let's uh, proceed uh, further. I'm going to skip uh, some of these things which uh, I wanted to discuss related to normal stresses. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll just make uh, highlight this point that if I write the Maxwell model, uh, which is uh, the linear model, right? Uh, and I will write the three-dimensional version of it uh, where there are only partial derivatives, but for a Simple shear. Simple shear implies that I have only the uh, situation which we most often draw in fluid mechanics and rheology, which is just uh, have a coordinate system where uh, we have only velocity v and it's only a function of y. So because of this, uh, and if I impose, what I will have is only gamma dot yx will be non-zero. Uh, all the other terms, dx, x, dy, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, d, y, y, uh, d, uh, all, all those will be zero. And so if I write now the Maxwell model for simple shear, uh, these are the four equations that I'll get. Uh, given that it's a simple shear flow, uh, the only components that are uh, of interest are these four, because uh, tau y, z, and uh, tau x, z are anyway zero. So, but based on this, you can see that uh, at steady state, when all these derivatives fall out, so whenever we have the steady state, uh, these derivatives will go to zero. And uh, what you will see is tau yy is zero, tau zz is zero, and similarly tau xx is also zero. So the normal stress difference is, according to a viscoelastic model, but a linear model like Maxwell model, uh, there are no normal stress differences. But now, if I look at the same thing for an upper convected Maxwell model, where uh, the partial derivative has been replaced by convected rate. What I can see is the stress components now uh, for again simple shear, where there is only gamma dot yx is the only non zero term. But now you can see that uh, these terms are non zero. And so tau xx is also going to be non zero. So even if I wait for steady state to be reached, at steady state, this will go to zero. This will go to zero. So let me just write, uh, if I write steady state, this will go to zero. And uh, this will also go to zero. But, but I can still write tau xx minus lambda del vx by del y tau yx plus tau xy 
del V X by del Y is equal to zero. And the second one, which is tau Y X minus lambda, uh, tau Y Y is zero. So this I can drop out. So this will also go to zero. Is equal to two eta d y x or eta gamma dot y x. So the upper convected Maxwell model says that uh, tau y x is uh, simply like a Newtonian fluid eta gamma dot y x. Stress is proportional to strain rate. However, it says that tau x x is non-zero. And uh, since I know that uh, del v x by del y is uh, uh, gamma gamma dot and tau y x and tau x y are anyway same because it's a symmetric tensor i can write tau x x as tau y x into gamma dot or i can also write this as 2 eta lambda gamma dot y x squared So therefore, normal stress difference does exist. Tau xx is non-zero, tau yy is zero, tau xx minus tau yy is non-zero. So upper convected Maxwell model is the simplest viscoelastic model which shows normal stress differences. And uh, just the way shear stress is proportional to strain rate, normal stress is proportional to strain rate squared. And so many times when normal stresses are characterized for complex fluids, uh, you will define a coefficient uh, which is like this. Just the way here, the coefficient that we define is eta, and eta is equal to tau y x by gamma dot y x. So similarly, and this kind of a coefficient is called the normal stress coefficient, first normal stress difference coefficient. So uh, this gives us an idea uh, related to, uh, so I'm going to skip uh, some of the discussion related to uh, uh, the upper convected Maxwell model, uh, one other way in which we can modify uh, the uh, simpler, uh, one minute, Anurag just uh, was uh, asking something, uh, what is the difference between a single spring dashboard series model and a dumbbell model by Karan? Uh, so Anurag, uh, so Karan, uh, uh, a single spring dashboard model uh, and uh, dumbbell are identical. So I, I don't see any, uh, oh, sim single spring dashboard series model. Okay, okay, huh. no, no, so they wait. Uh, so these two are two different, uh, uh, so so uh, the uh, single spring and dashboard model is again a phenomenological model. So when I write, uh, let me just uh, use uh, a slide before so that I can answer that question. OK, there's no place on this slide, and I'm not able to add a new page, which is what I was looking at. OK, I, I will use this slide to say, so uh, when we, when we, see, uh, the, the way to use this model uh, is basically to say that, you know, when I apply some stress uh, on the material, uh, this one uh, will see the same stress, but uh, this one, the strain will be epsilon 1, this one strain will be epsilon 2, and uh, epsilon will be the overall strain. And so this uh, phenomenological model is what this is. Because we, though we are saying there is a spring and a dashboard, we are still saying that, look, the spring represents the elastic response. And so these are very different class of models. Now, when we are talking about a dumbbell model, now I am making a hypothesis at the microscopic scale itself. I am saying that the spring represents the macromolecule. And so the spring constant will depend on what is the flexibility of macromolecule. So if I take polyethylene, its flexibility will be different. But if I take, uh, let's say, polystyrene, or if I take polyether ketone, its flexibility will be different. So now what I am doing when I am doing a dumbbell model, I am capturing the microscopic mechanisms in my model. So that's the difference. And uh, what happens is, in this case, you will need to use uh, statistical mechanics. So what you do is you say, just the way the macromolecules, there are 10 to the power 23. 
so what you say is these dumbbells which represent the macromolecules are also multiple in number they are all doing their random fluctuating motion just the way macromolecule is also undergoing random conformational changes and then when i average when i do statistical uh, mechanics of this and average out i will get to know average orientation average stress average velocity and so on so that's why the dumbbell model is a microscopic uh, model using statistical mechanics kinetic theory kind of formulations while the spring dashpot models are completely phenomenological model which just capture the elastic viscous response in a visual way so that's the major difference and please don't get confused between the two okay uh, jaydeep is asking question related to ptt uh, yeah i'll come to that uh, in a minute uh, after some maybe uh, what i'll do uh, next uh, because we are already reaching past well past 12 so uh, i will skip this uh, uh, model uh, but i'll just say that uh, uh, one other example and this is quite uh, useful for uh, thixotropic materials where a, a maxwell type model is combined with some uh, structure and we get a thixotropic model so it's a uh, another class of material and these again become non linear because uh, we we have uh, variations uh, so sp depends on uh, strain rate and uh, eta depends on strain rate or lambda relaxation time depends on strain rate so they again become non linear and they can explain the non linear rheological response of material which have structure built into them or thixotropic materials so i'll i'll uh, just mention this but uh, skip some of the discussion related to that and uh, one of the popular model is this uh, ptt model and again uh, just the way i had written very general linear viscoelastic model i can write a very general non linear viscoelastic model with uh, just collecting terms and this is what uh, was done by oldroyd and uh, if you look at uh, there is an old oldroyd uh, eight constant model which is like a very it's like a master model and many of the other models that we see today are uh, some small modifications of this or simplifications of this so ptt model uh, which as i explained uh, was developed uh, in uh, 70s 80s uh, to account for uh, the entangled melt uh, it's one uh, the yx component look like this so there is this coefficient uh, which multiplies and it's the trace of stress and so there are a couple of versions of this model and uh, one of them is called exponential uh, as jaydeep was jaydeep was saying and uh, where the factor uh, is uh, related to the uh, trace of stress but you can see that solving these kind of models is not going to be trivial uh, but given the computational tools that we have at hand today uh, if you look at any commercial package whether it's finite element based or whether it's finite volume based many of them will incorporate ptt as one of the menu choices so i can choose if i am doing polymer melt uh, processing and i am trying to simulate it on a large scale for a mold then i can choose a ptt model and then try attempting a solution of the governing equations and uh, similarly gesekas model is also a very uh, common model and uh, as i had mentioned it's for uh, a polymer solution so it made a hypothesis of a solvent contribution and a polymer contribution and the overall stress being just the sum of uh, individual solvent and polymer contributions and importantly there is a non linear parameter which uh, or also called anisotropy parameter which i talked about earlier and uh, if this is zero then uh, this model falls back to the oldroyd and upper convected kind of a model you can see that it's a non linear term where stress is multiplying stress and and so this kisikis model is called rheology uh, because uh, i'll just flash these slides you can see that uh, the model still is very complicated Uh, in simple shear newtonian fluid model is there in this 
where uh, tau y x will be just equal to this, right? So that's also there. So tau y x equal to this is just the Newtonian model. Then if this is also included, then it's Maxwell model. If this is also included, then it becomes upper convected Maxwell model. And these are the terms which are due to Gesicke's model. And of course, there are terms in other equations also. But uh, in uh, a minute, I'll just show, uh, for example, it can show uh, shear thinning behavior, Gesicke's model. And by varying the anisotropy parameter, you can change the extent of shear thinning. It can also show uh, normal stress differences. And unlike upper convected Maxwell model, it is not constant. Again, this is very commonly observed in many uh, polymeric systems or colloidal systems. And it also shows uh, stress growth, which is appropriate. So therefore, uh, Gesicke's model uh, captures uh, some of the uh, uh, features which are associated with uh, realistic uh, materials which are observed. So with this, uh, we can uh, uh, take a pause. And uh, if there are any question, what I have done so far is basically conveyed to you uh, the uh, ideas related to modeling uh, at a general uh, scale. Uh, all the things that I discussed are part of textbook uh, discussion related to rheology. So any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, Vishal, we can discuss the uh, nonlinear PTT model uh, later uh, uh, because that may be of interest to only a few people. So once the lecture is over, we can uh, discuss a little bit more related to the PTT model itself. Are there any other questions? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a one minute break. Uh, I'll just stand up, stretch and come back. Uh, if you also feel to do the same, please do that. Uh, I, I'll just also uh, project another. Uh, so I'll stop presenting now because I have to start another presentation. So I'll do that and I'll join back in, I mean, in one minute. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'll spend now some time on uh, uh, use of some of these models that we discussed uh, for uh, uh, material systems of interest. And uh, uh, again, uh, what I uh, will not do is discuss uh, in great detail uh, one material and its overall modeling, uh, but give you a snapshot of uh, how uh, we, uh, by using three different materials, uh, we are trying to look at uh, the nonlinear rheology uh, of uh, uh, polymeric systems, uh, which uh, ha seem to have a network and gel-like uh, response uh, at the microstructural scale. So before I begin, are there any questions related to what we discussed so far? Uh, the text box. Hello, sir. Yeah, Hello. Yeah. yeah. So I want to ask a question. What is the What are the uh, advantages of uh, Gisaka's model uh, with, com uh, with compared to the other models? Uh, compared to which other model? Other models, like uh, those models are used here. Uh, uh -huh. what are the of no, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, upper convected Maxwell model uh, gives us normal stress difference, but uh, it's a constant. And similarly, viscosity is also constant. And uh, most of the real fluids, uh, complex fluids, will show uh, shear thinning, shear thickening, viscosity, as well as they will have non uh, constant uh, normal stress differences. So Gisica's model, in fact, shows uh, qualitatively these features that uh, viscosity, shear thinning, as well as normal stress difference, which is not constant. Okay. So uh, therefore, Gisica's model is uh, one of the simplest nonlinear model which captures qualitatively the features which are seen in many polymeric uh, gels and solutions. Okay, okay. Okay, sir. Right. Yeah. Any any other question? Yeah, yeah sir. Uh, one more question, sir. Uh, sir, one more question, sir. 
sir uh, if there is a, i have a polymeric solution which has a strong viscoelastic shear thinning pro- ah. shear thinning property right. then which kind of uh, model sh- should i prefer to model that such kind of polymeric solution strong viscoelastic shear thinning yeah so, so you can look at this second option so gisikus okay okay so because in majority of the polymeric uh, solution shows that uh, at concentrated uh, polymeric solution which exhibits a strong uh, shear thinning property if you want to okay. investigate the viscoelasticity of these polymer solutions then a model like gisikus which not only shows shear thinning yeah viscoelastic sir. yeah so it will show shear thinning but it will show all the other properties okay. in terms gisikus of, works well in terms of normal stress differences creep stress and also not just small deformation but also large deformation so for example just as an interest if you are interested in capturing viscoelasticity by doing large amplitude oscillatory shear then gisikus model will uh, might be able to capture even the large amplitude oscillatory shear of these kind of systems okay okay A- any other question before we hello okay uh, ah yeah hello yeah i think janesh has a uh, question yeah Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, this question is not related uh, with the viscoelastic uh, properties. It's more uh, ah. for non-Newtonian behavior of fluids. Right. Uh, so, uh, multi-parameter models like uh, uh, carrier sort of model. Uh, actually, uh, I have encountered one problem with my PhD work. So, I tried to fit. Ah. Uh, uh, The viscosity data uh, with carrier pseudo model, ah. but unfortunately mm-hmm. the uh, high shear viscosity, like infinite shear viscosity values, came in negative ah. uh, uh, values. So, right. uh, like I, I used uh, Anton Pass uh, software itself, but it was showing some negative ah. values in that. So I was uh, a bit worried about it, uh, even though I solved it with uh, right. some other tools, solvers and everything. I just wanted to know, uh-huh. like, uh, what if, like, uh, the infinite shear viscosity values are coming in negative? Does it signify anything? Yeah. So I, I, yeah. No. So I think what uh, there are there are two possibilities. One uh, that uh, see the Carrier-Sudha model basically uh, is, is making a phenomenological uh, uh, hypothesis that there are two Newtonian plateaus: the low shear and high shear plateaus. Okay. Uh, yes, but these need not be uh, observed for all materials uh, so so therefore uh, it, it may not be the best model secondly it, you may have to uh, apply some constraints and then do the modeling you you can uh, say that uh, uh, eta infinity uh, you can do constraint optimization using matlab or some other tools and then impose a physically reasonable condition and then see whether you get good fit so that's uh, other possibilities to look for uh, what happens is sometimes the shear thinning can be very strong and uh, mm-hmm. so therefore that may be associated with let's say yielding kind of a phenomena okay and to capture yielding with caro yasuda may not be very effective so you might have to move to a model which incorporates yielding into the mechanism so that's why you have okay. to think uh, along both the lines where mathematically you do constraint optimization secondly think whether is there a mechanism involved where so the the choice of caro yasuda itself may not be very appropriate okay okay sir okay yeah. thank you sir uh, okay so uh, given that uh, uh, what i had uh, originally planned was 1 hour for basics and 1 hour for uh, my uh, uh, discussion of research but uh, i think now uh, we have uh, limited time remaining so i'll just uh, give you some uh, basic ideas Uh, related to what was the work we pursued and uh, this is largely work of uh, uh, ramya a phd student who just uh, sorry now she is dr ramya she just finished her phd a couple of months ago and uh, so uh, what uh, we have done uh, in uh, ramya's thesis is to investigate uh, uh, large deformation behavior uh, Uh, given that oscillatory shear and rotational rheometers are very common uh, can we use uh, the same method uh, of rheometry for large deformations and uh, 
the large deformation uh, allows us uh, so that chain will be getting extended more uh, the material structure will change and if you are able to describe the large deformation behavior from a practical point of view this is very useful because in a real life uh, a performance situation or during processing large deformations are encountered so that's why nonlinear rheology and laos uh, have become very popular in the last uh, 15 20 years and uh, what uh, in general we focus on are materials which are uh, gel, gel like materials and and so in these materials uh, you can also track uh, the phenomenon of gelation itself but specifically uh, we have looked at three different materials uh, one is called a supramolecular gel where uh, we have small molecules which assemble themselves and that's why it's called supra and molecule so small molecules get assembled and make a supra molecule and then the supra molecular forms fibril and these fibrils uh, basically interact with each other and then you get a gel like uh, material so this is one example the other example that we looked at was a cross linked polymer so it's a macro molecule but it is cross linked and uh, the cross link can be covalent bond or it can be physical interactions so that's a second class of materials and then uh, we have uh, a micellar system which is formed by block copolymers there is one block of polymer another block of of polymer but these polymers are different so we have a block copolymer and because there is no block copolymer this behaves like a surfactant and it can form a micelle and so these micelles can form a gel so the common feature in the, these three material systems is this uh, overall gel like response but you can see microscopically the mechanisms are uh, different the, the way the network is formed the way the chain of the network is formed uh, or uh, in case of block copolymer gel there is no no network but still there are these micelles which are organized into a gel like response so when we look at uh, each of these materials uh, this uh, could be useful uh in terms of uh, a thickener kind of application uh this could be used uh, in terms of a drug delivery kind of application so what happens to these materials when you are injecting them when you are uh, deforming them and so on when they swell what happens to it so with these in background uh we looked at the nonlinear rheology so whenever we say nonlinear rheology uh we could do uh, let's say measurement of normal stress differences or we could do creep stress relaxation at very large deformations uh, but uh, uh, large amplitude oscillatory shear allows us to uh, measure nonlinearity by using the same uh, mechanisms that we uh, same uh, methodology that we use for looking at g prime g double prime in the system and uh, given that there are so many materials with uh, time dependent structural processes such as uh, aging materials uh, weak gel so all of them uh, laos uh, becomes a useful tool to analyze the structure on one hand and deformation behavior on the other hand and so this is valid for both uh, polymeric system as well as uh, particulate systems so these are uh, very uh, different ways in which laos is used in quantification of the material response uh, when when we talked about steady shear viscosity is used to quantify and uh, viscosity can be constant then it's a newtonian fluid if viscosity depends on strain rate then it's a non newtonian fluid now similarly if we measure g prime and g double prime at small deformation and it's constant then we say it's a rubber like material or a gel like material and so on so if we now go to large deformation what happens is uh, g prime and g double prime are functions of not only frequency but the amplitude which was applied so the strain amplitude also determines the moduli secondly uh, if we have a strain which is uh, gamma not sin omega t the output stress is 
not just omega but 3 omega 5 omega and so on so it's a sinusoidal fourier series with higher harmonics so we can characterize the first harmonic which is g prime but we can also characterize higher harmonics so that's another way to look at large deformation behavior by quantifying so i can look at the intensity of higher harmonics so let's say the intensity of third harmonic and its relation to intensity of uh, first harmonic so this i3 by i1 will be zero for uh, materials which are in the linear regime because in the linear regime there is only first harmonic but as i start increasing the strain amplitude non linear behavior kicks in and the third harmonic is non zero so that's why it's a quantification of the non linear response similarly uh, i can do decomposition instead of doing it in fourier space i can do using chebyshev polynomial and i will get other a set of coefficients like i3 here i will get some other coefficients and again i can analyze them with respect to elastic and viscous contributions i can also look at one single cycle so i can plot uh, stress versus strain and uh, if it's like this during a cycle then immediately you will recognize that this is an elastic material because uh, stress is uh, linearly proportional and even if i increase or decrease stress it just keeps on going up and down on the same line and therefore this is an elastic material so if i look at stress strain for a viscoelastic material i'll get an idea Uh, of uh, what is the qualitative response during a cycle so i can look at stress versus strain as well as stress versus strain rate and then uh, i can uh, use uh, some of the measures in, in the stress versus strain plots or stress versus strain rate plots to quantify for example if i get stress versus strain like this so this is zero center is zero and uh, maybe i'll just use another uh, color to so this is the strain stress strain response what you can see is there is a pronounced strain thickening as i increase the strain the stress becomes very high it's like a rubber band when i stretch it little bit more it becomes harder to pull so it's what is called strain thickening increasing strain leads to higher and higher stress so if uh, the strain thickening can i quantify it and so these are different ways in which uh, large amplitude oscillatory shear uh, is used to quantify the non linear response of uh, materials and in our work uh, what we have tried to do is the three materials for which i described uh, which is a cross link polymer gel or a block co polymer gel or a supra molecular system we have tried to measure a lot of these quantities and then parallelly we have used models to try to say whether we can capture the mechanisms uh, using hypothesis of a model and then do the the two match the experimental measurements that we have done and uh, the models that we get and from an overall uh, point of view of analysis you can do uh, one more additional thing for example i can change the composition of my sample so the degree of cross linking i can change or uh, the concentration of supra molecular uh, 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 molecule i can change or i can change the ph so that it changes the interaction and it changes the supra molecular fibrillar assembly i can change the temperature on the block co polymer gel so by changing all these i manipulate the mechanisms at the microscopic scale and using the model can i again capture them under different conditions so uh, this way we can uh, achieve an understanding of the material response which is far more complete so that's the approach uh, which uh, ramya followed in many of the uh, work so uh, uh, i'll skip through some of these uh, generic discussions related to uh, large amplitude oscillatory shear and uh, look at uh, just explain the three systems first uh, any question so far uh, again you can type in the text box sir uh, sir yeah. i have a question sir. yeah 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 please go ahead sir is it sir uh, why only uh, odd harmonic will appear for lao as experiment sir uh, so that's only uh, why that's... odd harmonic will come appear 
yeah why so not even it's in in general from a time uh, series point of view higher harmonics will appear and so that could be odd or even harmonics but uh, in case of uh, rheology and material response there is a symmetry uh, associated with uh, the material response in the sense that if i shear the material this way or if i change the direction which becomes the negative strain rate uh, the response is going to be the same so that uh, if you use then okay. it gets uh, into this uh, it it shows that therefore odd harmonics will only be there in fact uh, maybe okay. i have a slide to quickly explain that uh, let me see if so i mean you can just try to understand it uh, when you try to explain uh, express the overall stress uh, in terms of uh, uh, the series so this is the linear model and uh, so uh, given that uh, there is a symmetry associated with it uh, it doesn't matter whether strain is positive or negative you will get the same stress in the material and so that's why it's in the even harmonics and therefore uh, since the material modulus is even harmonics the stress ends up being odd harmonics because you multiply it once more so you get uh, first third and fifth harmonic uh, for these material systems uh, any other question no sir no sir you carry on carry on. so the first uh, material that we looked at uh, was uh, a supramolecular uh, system and uh, it is uh, supramolecular uh, by using uh, these amino acid based based uh, derivatives and uh, it's it's a molecule which has uh, pi stacking possible uh, there are hydrophobic interactions possible and there is hydrogen bonding possible so the molecules can stack on top of each other and uh, that is what is uh, sort of shown in this uh, slide here so if uh, you picture these with uh, pi this is pi interaction uh, then there is a hydrogen bonding interaction site and then there is a hydrophobic interaction site with these three interaction sites the molecules stack on top of each other and then they form these uh, helices uh, then there are bundle of helices and bundles basically form a network and uh, in the network then there can be solvent trap and so these become a gel like systems and that's why uh, beyond a certain uh, uh, concentration uh, you will see that uh, if you invert the trial uh, vial uh, it will not fall down because it's become a gel so the the question uh, is uh, one of the things that we were trying to look at is if you look at the variation of g prime and g double prime with strain uh, can we learn something from this so the first harmonic itself if we take a look at does it tell us something about uh, what is the structural response of the material and so in this material uh, for example uh, this is how uh, the, so the if you look at strain so this is the amplitude of strain we are varying from uh, 0.1 all the way till 1000% so that's why this is called the large amplitude uh, we are deforming the generally we think of oscillatory shear as a very small deformation now we are deforming to a very large extent and now these uh, fibrils which are there in the material if we do very small deformation they are pretty much the network stays intact but if we start doing very large deformation then the network is going to get disrupted and so g prime if you look at uh, up to about uh, uh, 1 or uh, 2% strain uh, it uh, remains roughly constant for both these gels these two gels one is prepared at 6 and another one at 7.4 but beyond uh, the uh, uh, strain uh, which is uh, given here there is a very strong decrease and uh, what you can also notice is g double prime increase
increases and then decreases. So, uh, given that G double prime is increasing, what you can uh, say is the dissipation in the material is increasing. So, can it this be related to some of the dissociations and disaggregation and uh, solvent flow which is there in the system? And then there seems to be two steps. Are these two steps real? So, you can see that there is a step here and then there is a step there. So, there is a change in uh, slope. So, is, is it because there is a two steps of structural breakdown that's happening in the material? So, those are the kinds of questions that you can pose. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, it's possible to do some of the classification and this has been around for quite some time now where you look at how does G prime and G double prime uh, vary as a function of uh, strain. So, you have system where both of them decrease, then you have a system where both of them increase and then uh, both of them go through a maximum and decrease. And uh, this is the system we have for uh, the supramolecular system. So, what are the materials which show this kind of class of response? And then uh, can I choose a model which can then predict uh, this kind of response? So, those will be the sort of questions that we try to address. So, uh, does the variation of G double prime is similar? Uh, no, of course not. The variation is useful for classification. And uh, does this variation gives clues about the structural response? Yes, because you can sort of uh, look at, uh, you know, the disaggregation and it seems to have different response. Uh, and this is very different compared to polymer solution or melt. Because polymer solution or melt generally will show this kind of a response. So, clearly the supramolecular system uh, mechanistically is very different. So, this is one example. And uh, in this case, uh, we uh, prepare like a Maxwell model, but then the uh, right hand side has uh, features of a network. And then there is a network creation and network loss because all these fibrils form network and when we are deforming them at large deformation, the network points break and reform. So, we basically uh, made a hypothesis of network modification kinetics due to formation and breakage. And uh, then the idea was, can we capture the response? And uh, given that uh, this uh, network undergoes uh, uh, breakage and uh, reformation and so on. And uh, this shows the result uh, with uh, where we had chosen three different relaxation times. As I discussed earlier. And you can see the, the red, uh, uh, these are three different modes and the overall response. And uh, this matches quite well with the uh, experimental response. Uh, over and above, we can get some idea of what is the number of segments and how they are getting broken or reformed at different deformations. And uh, I have a hypothesis of why pH 6, there is a particular response, why pH 7.4, there is another response and so on. So this is one example. Uh, I, I don't think I will have time to go through the remaining materials. Uh, so maybe I'll uh, first uh, uh, take a pause here and again ask you questions. Uh, uh, I mean, again, ask if there are any questions. As I had mentioned, we are also uh, becoming hungrier by the minute. So of course, for all I know, all of you may have already finished your lunch while I was speaking. Any question? Okay, uh, then I'll just uh, describe uh, one more material and uh, then maybe we'll uh, stop. So, uh, the uh, other way of looking at uh, the large amplitude oscillatory response and then try to model it uh, is to say that can I capture the higher harmonics? And do they tell me something about the kind of cross-linking that's there in the system? And also, uh, can I look at the uh, qualitative response during a cycle? And uh, will it be very different if I have a 
physically crosslink system and will it be very different if i have a chemically crosslink system so in this case uh, the material that we chose uh, is uh, polyvinyl alcohol based so this is a polymer uh, uh, polyvinyl alcohol and uh, it's depicted in red chains here and then there are transient crosslinks and it's a physically crosslink system and the transient crosslink are uh, boric acid based so this is a commonly used uh, uh, model material uh, it's also part of this silipity and various other uh, demonstration type of materials which are used in viscoelasticity uh, on the other hand we also chose a chemically crosslink system where the uh, pva chains uh, which are uh, depicted in red here are crosslinked uh, using a crosslinker and uh, over and above from a drug delivery point of view uh, we can uh, mix a, a crosslink system with another uh, molecule which is depicted in green here so so we have these two different material systems for which we were uh, trying to understand the relationship between nonlinear rheology and its structure and uh, so initially we just looked at linear rheology which i will skip but this is how for example the higher harmonics look so if i look at uh, strain amplitude as i start shearing at higher and higher strains the uh, non linear harmonics start appearing at very low strains the non linear harmonics are basically absent and so the response is linear uh also uh, some of you may have had to answer this question if you are working on rheology as to how do i decide the linear limit and uh, in general uh, there is no one answer for uh, this uh, because depending on the several measures that you use the sensitivity of that measure to delineating this limit uh, can vary so for example here this uh, uh, line that we have drawn uh, indicates the transition from linear to non linear but if you use a different measure it may shift here and there so generally if you are only interested in linear response it makes sense for uh, uh, to to sort of confine your attention maybe in this regime so that you are very far away from uh, the limit of uh, non linearity so now the question is uh, there, there is an increase what you can see is the increase is uh, more significant uh, for uh, the uh, crosslink system so this is chemically crosslinked and this is uh, physically crosslinked and so we we saw differences and the question was can you capture it using a model and so uh, the other feature that we were wanted to look at was what is the qualitative response during a cycle uh, whether it's physically crosslinked or chemically crosslinked systems and uh, this i've already explained that for uh, an elastic material you will only see straight line when you look at stress versus strain or for a newtonian fluid you will see a straight line in strain rate versus stress and uh, so when you plot it other way you will get uh, circles so for example stress versus strain rate for an elastic solid will be circle and uh, strain strain versus stress for a newtonian fluid will be a circle but most generally for a viscoelastic fluid you may see a more complicated shape so by looking at this shape can you figure out uh, the extent of viscous and elastic contributions and uh, this is how uh, uh, the response looks like uh, for uh, the chemically crosslink system you can see that there is a pre prominent strain thickening in the material strain increases uh, the stress increases much more rapidly as strain increases i think uh, one slide ah yeah while in pva borax which is the physically crosslink system the strain thickening is not as prominent and so in this case uh, we chose a model uh, which is a combination of gesicus model and a weak gel model 
and uh, so the mechanisms that we were trying to capture are uh, basically what are used in uh, network systems like uh, worm like uh, micellar uh, and then these are temporary and permanent networks with uh, strain stiffening due to chain extension so with these kind of uh, capturing of mechanisms we were able to explain in here now uh, the red and black there are two sets of uh, data and uh, one is model and the other one is uh, experimental data so you can see that uh, for a large value of uh, strain and uh, stress and frequency we can match uh, the experimental results and uh, this is for a pva borax system so this is a physical cross link so uh, i think with this maybe i'll stop i'll just summarize uh, so we we did the same thing for uh, block copolymers also where i had said that they form a gel but i'll i'll skip this because of the time uh, is not there and we we used a model which is uh, elasto visco plastic model in that case uh, which has this uh, soft glassy uh, mechanisms and uh, so uh, basically the uh, nonlinear rheology if you look at uh, there is a very large diversity of uh, uh, nonlinear measures you can have uh, higher harmonics you can have the uh, stress strain uh, cyclic data you can do chebyshev decomposition so there is a very large diversity of nonlinear measures and uh, all the three material systems show very interesting features that we looked at and uh, we were able to capture uh, the nonlinear rheology uh, by choosing a suitable model uh, as long as you follow a strategy in terms of picking the right mechanisms you can capture the overall qualitative and quantitative response and uh, so some initial part of the work uh, i would like to acknowledge was funded by dst and uh, ramya uh, dr ramya is the main per person who did uh, all the work while pramod the uh, help with some of the initial work related to the pluronic work and uh, dr ganesh uh, was uh, instrumental in getting us the supramolecular gels so the network dynamics work is in collaboration with uh, him so with these acknowledgments uh, i uh, thank you all again uh, and Yeah, Jaydev has again asked a question related to Rolly Polly. So I think Rolly Polly and PTT models uh, may be. I mean, it will be limit uh, of interest to few people uh, in polymer processing. Maybe we will have to meet some other time, and uh, I, I can give an explanation on both of these. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, yes, I have a you. question. How many? so how many types of models are exist to determine the viscoelastic behavior of fluid ah uh, there are uh, actually yeah so since uh, I, i don't know whether i'll be quickly able to show you uh, because this is uh, there there are uh, the short answer is there are hundreds okay hundreds yeah more than hundreds oh. and uh, this is captured in this uh, uh, uh I, i'll show you this uh, slide given that i am uh, this is one feature that uh, i can so i i'll show you this is one of the books uh, which uh, and a uh, rheologist uh, book and they, this is how they so announcing the grand opening of rheology drug store our motto fit the data to make your experiment agree we have uh, the right fluids and there are 30 40 different models and and so you can see the okay. names of some of these models uh, that i already talked about also i talked about yes, maxwell sir. i talked about doy edwards i talked about old droid yes, sickers ptt so so yes, the, there is a there is a very large variety of models so in in, so uh, in one sense in one sense uh, it's a uh, it means that we don't understand a whole lot uh, in the other sense okay. also there is a lot of opportunity for us to figure out which model may work for which material system so both ways if you look at hmm. so I, i i don't know if uh, so was your question related to you know how do i choose 
sir how to select the model yeah, which yeah, one is uh, uh, no, no, there is no answer there is hmm. no uh, like a rule book saying do this first do this first no so you you will have to do as i said initially you first make a hypothesis you know of what class of response okay. this material is likely to be then you do some measurements uh, make some material function measurements hmm. then uh, try to understand them uh, with respect to some okay. composition changes then pick up one model and then that's how you, you have to do there's no general guideline okay thank you sir uh any other uh, question okay then uh, so i think anurag uh, we will uh, call it quits okay okay thank you sir okay. thank you for giving us such sure, a valuable sure. time sure thank sure you. yeah thank you all and good luck uh, good. yeah thank you so much